Thank you very much, Mort. I uh, appreciate the invitation today to discuss uh, my thoughts about the future for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, I would start by saying I think it's going to be a pretty slow path forward. Um, the things that I hope we see over the next several years are better prognostic models, uh, whether that be functional imaging or biomarkers. Uh, hopefully we will find a less toxic regimen than BACOP to treat our high-risk advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma patients. And hopefully, in addition to brinduximab, we'll be able to identify other new agents that have a um, less toxic or have less toxicity than the current regimens that we're using. I just want to start with looking at the uh, prognostic markers and when, where we're going and where we are with that right now, and just put this one background slide up to remind folks about the um, international prognostic uh, score, which we've been using now for almost <coughs> two decades, and to look at the five-year progression-free survival and five-year overall survival according to the risk groups in the IPS. And you can see that the low-risk patients have an 88% five-year progression-free survival, and the highest risk group, about 62%. The overall progression-free survival, 78%. So um, maybe about a 25% spread in there. So again, um, hoping that we can find something to separate these patients out even further and figure out who these 20% of patients that are going to relapse are before we start therapy and think about new options for that group of patients. So is functional imaging the future in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, specifically the use of interim PET? And I think the best way to look at this uh, in terms of advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma is to look at the preliminary results that were recently presented by Dr. Press, uh, both in Lugano and Cologne this year, of the um, results from a phase two study that was uh, done by the, all three of the U.S. cooperative groups and was a um, response-adapted therapy for stage three and four disease using an early interim PET imaging uh, to make treatment decisions. This is the schema for the study, that all patients received two cycles of ABVD and then had a PET scan. If they were PET negative, they went on to receive four additional cycles of ABVD. If they were PET positive, they went on to receive six cycles of escalated BACOP. Just by way of reminder that patients with stage three and four disease were eligible, all risk factors were eligible. This is one of the first studies that um, used ABVD at full dose on schedule regardless of counts and with no growth factors uh, recommended. They had 371 patients registered and there were 18% of patients who had a positive PET and 82% of patients who had a negative PET and they used a London Duville score of three as the cutoff so that patients who had scores of one, two, or three were considered negative. That means less than or equal to uptake of liver in the residual masses and patients who had London Duville of four or five were considered positive and went on to receive BACOP. In terms of the preliminary results, this is the overall survival uh, with a 16-month median follow-up. Uh, looks quite good at 95% two-year estimated overall survival. There have been nine deaths overall in the study. Three of those were treatment-related deaths, only one death in the ABVD arm, and two of 50 patients, so 4% uh, mortality in the patients who were receiving escalated BACOP. This shows the progression-free survival, uh, again just by reminder the median follow-up of about 16 months and the overall two-year progression-free survival for all patients, so the PET positive and PET negative together, about 76 percent. So uh, the study had um, the goal was to reach an overall progression-free survival of 78%, so they didn't quite achieve that. And again, thinking back about our IPS slide with uh, modern therapy, that the overall survival that we were seeing prior to this study was in the 70 to 75% range. And then this shows the difference in progression-free survival for the patients who had a negative PET after cycle two of ABVD compared to those who had a positive PET. As you can see, for those who had a negative PET, the two-year progression-free survival was 79%. For those who had a positive PET and went on to receive escalated BACOP, 61%. This number was better than the um, goal for the protocol, which they had 
hoped to achieve about a 50% progression-free survival here, and this wasn't quite as good as they had hoped, thinking that they would reach uh, an 82% two-year progression-free survival. So I think um, we were surprised about, uh, I think more surprised actually about the upper curve, that we were very hopeful that a negative interim PET would call out um, patients who had a very good prognosis, and while 79% is good, it certainly isn't what we were hoping for to try and find the 90 or 95% of patients. So this makes me wonder whether uh, we should be using this to identify the very um, good patients, and that I think it does bring into question in the future whether we should be looking at trying to de-escalate these patients. I think if we had found a 90 or 95 percent progression-free survival in that group that we could have started thinking about are these patients that we could actually give less therapy to, but I think these results bring that approach into question. And the issue with the bottom curve is, although it looks quite good compared to the historical comparison, which was a retrospective study of interim PET, which showed, I think we've all seen that curve with a 12 percent uh, two-year progression-free survival. So it certainly looks much better than that, but still it was not randomized. And so we don't have any prospective or randomized studies looking at PET positive and giving half those patients standard ABVD and giving the other half of the patients a different therapy. So while it looks better, um, I think we can't make definitive conclusions about that either. Then I thought this was very interesting, which is um, the breakdown of the patients according to their London Duville score. And uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is that all three of the curves for patients who had a negative PET, London Duville of one, two, or three, were all exactly the same, so all about 80%. So again, I think that tells us that whether you have a completely negative PET, no uptake whatsoever, versus uptake equivalent to liver, that you can't use that differentiation to tell you who's the best patient and who might have um, done better with additional therapy or different therapy. And again, I think the uh, high-risk patients, again, look promising with switching to escalated BACOP, especially these patients. There were five patients, which again, hard to know what you can make of that, who had a London Duville of five, which actually means progression on their ABVD. And um, that four of those five patients are still alive after receiving escalated BACOP. So then the second study, which was just recently presented at Cologne, uh, looking at interim PET for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, was the International Raffle Study, which was presented by Dr. Johnson um, for the UK. And again, similar uh, schema, two cycles of ABVD, PET negative. Um, these patients who were PET negative were actually randomized to four additional cycles of ABVD versus four cycles of AVD, so leaving bleomycin out in the last four cycles. And the PET positive patients, I think, were initially getting uh, BACOP14, but then it was questionable about whether that was equivalent to escalated BACOP, so at some point, in the middle of the study, I think they then allowed those patients to get escalated BACOP instead of BACOP14. This study, as opposed to the SWOG study, also included some high-risk stage 2 patients, accrued nearly 1,200 patients. Um, the breakdown on PET positive and PET negative were similar, and they used the same cutoff as the U.S. cooperative group study, so 16% were PET negative, 84, I mean, were PET positive, 84% PET negative. They didn't show any progression-free survival curves, at least they're not in the abstract. I wasn't actually at the meeting. Um, but they did give you the events at one year. So in the PET negative group, there were 9% of patients who had events, so either relapse or death, uh, compared to 22% in, in the PET positive group. They presented the grade three and four non-hematologic AEs for the randomized patients who got ABVD versus AVD and did show a significantly increased risk of grade three and four toxicity in patients who were getting ABVD compared to AVD, and they did not present any data about the outcome of the patients, and I think they just need a significantly longer follow-up. But hopefully, the outcome of this will be that we will be able to eliminate bleomycin, at least for the last four cycles, without uh, giving up any efficacy.
So then, uh, sort of to come back, is functional imaging the future in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma? My conclusion after looking at these two um, recent studies, although again, these were preliminary results, I think we need to wait for the final results, um, is that it's actually somewhat questionable uh, that the interim PET did not select a quote unquote very favorable subset of patients. Um, at least in this WOG study, and we're still waiting for the uh, update on the Raffle study. But if you look at the patients who had a London Duville score of one, two, or three, the two-year progression-free survival is 80%. If you go back to the good old IPS, patients who had low-risk disease as identified by an IPS of zero to two had a five-year progression-free survival of 80 to 80 per, eight percent. So again, not sure whether uh, we've made progress with that. The PET-positive patients, again, were not randomized. The two-year progression-free survival of 61% with six cycles of escalated BACOP looks encouraging, toxic therapy, 4% uh, early mortality. So my conclusion is that uh, we need better therapies for both the PET positive and the PET negative patients compared to where we are now. So how about biologic prognostic markers? Uh, are these the future for advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma? I'm just going to use a couple of examples, CD68 being the one I think that has kind of floated to the top most recently uh, based on a publication in New England Journal of Medicine uh, in 2010 from the group at British Columbia. And uh, CD68 and also CD163 are both tumor-associated macrophage markers, and I think we've all heard lots of discussion about the microenvironment in Hodgkin's and how that's very important. Um, and so they looked at the uh, CD68 staining and correlated that with disease-specific survival in, in Hodgkin lymphoma. And the top curve are patients who had very low expression of CD68, and the middle curve and the bottom curve are patients who had more than 5% expression of CD68. And as you can see, there's uh, a nice um, demarcation between these two groups. Um, I would point out that the highest risk group still has a 10-year uh, progression-free survival of over 60%, so it's not picking out a terrible patient. And the other thing I think to point out are the percent of patients. So in these bottom two curves, this encompasses 75% of the patients. So if we were to be using CD68 and saying patients who had more than 5% of CD68, which really looks very similar to having more than 25%, need a different therapy. That means we're giving something new, perhaps more toxic, to 75% of the patients. In addition to the fact that this doesn't pick out a, um, a very high risk group of patients and includes uh, a major percentage of the patients, the other issue uh, with all of these prognostic markers is the reproducibility. Uh, and so I think there's probably been 10 publications now about CD68 and CD163 in terms of the prognostic significance in Hodgkin lymphoma. And this is the largest study, which I put up here, uh, which included 265 patients and was published in Annals of Oncology about a year after the initial New England Journal of Medicine article. And both the disease-specific survival and the progression-free survival were uh, no different for patients who had CD68 staining less than 25% versus greater than 25%. They had four pathologists, two in Rio, which is where all these cases were, and two at Stanford review all the pathology. The results were very similar for both groups of pathologists. We also looked at CD68 and 163 at our own institution in 88 patients who had newly diagnosed Hodgkin lymphoma and um, did find a correlation with overall survival for the CD163, but absolutely no correlation with the CD68. So um, again, there's probably about 10 studies. They're all over the board in terms of whether they agree or disagree. And then the only other prognostic factor that I want to talk about is, again, a recent publication from the same group uh, at British Columbia uh, looking at ex gene expression profiling, uh, which obviously has been discussed and thrown around with non-Hodgkin lymphoma for many years now and, and I think still hasn't really made it to uh, prime time for NHL and I suspect we're going to have the same issues with Hodgkin's. So they looked at 290 patients who were treated on E2496, which was the big phase three cooperative group study comparing ABVD to Stanford 5. Um, 
Encouragingly, they were able to use paraffin tissue to do their analysis, and they initially did gene expression profiling of 259 genes, which had previously been identified as important and prognostic in Hodgkin's, and they came up with a 23-gene outcome predictor, and then they used the uh, model that they came up with and tested it in an independent population-based cohort in British Columbia and had the same findings that they did in the um, training cohort, so the five-year overall survival uh, for the high-risk group was 63% versus 92% for the low-risk cohort. And this model uh, was superior to both IPS and CD68 in multivariate analysis. Uh, I think the same issues uh, in terms of um, it does have a big split here, but even the highest risk patients have an overall survival of 63%. So our biologic prognostic markers uh, likely to be the future in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. And I think, um, unfortunately not, I think the science is fascinating, and hopefully we will learn a lot more about the biology of Hodgkin's by uh, looking at these markers, but so many issues that I've already touched on. One big problem is that these biologic markers are what I would describe as a moving target, so every six months there's a new publication, first at CD68, CD163, then the next publication says you should be using CD68 in combination with Fox. P3, and then the next one says you should be using this 23 gene expression profile, and if you're designing clinical trials, by the time the study opens, your prognostic model is already uh, out of date. Certainly need external validation for each of these new models, which is hard in Hodgkin's because there aren't that many patients, and need standardized methodology, as you can see from the CD68 data. Um, that it's very hard to reproduce, um, need portable platforms, so for this gene expression profiling, unless this is easy for pathologists to do, um, then that will also uh, be unlikely to be useful. And then each time we come up with a new marker, uh, we have to test that. If we have a new treatment, we have to test that prognostic marker and see whether it's still valid uh, with our new therapy. So again, I think it's going to be a, a very, very slow process. So going on to my uh, second wish, which is uh, trying to find less toxic treatments for the high-risk patients than BACOP. Again, I think it's going to be a while before we get there. This is just a slide that summarizes, uh, again, the two recently completed trials, the SWOG study and the Rathel study uh, for advanced stage Hodgkin, and then below the line are the studies which are still accruing patients, and uh, BACOP is abbreviated with the bright blue uh, Bs on there, so you can see that every one of these trials uh, has B in it and uh, sometimes a lot of B, especially for the Germans, who are giving it to uh, all the patients, whether they're um, pet negative or pet positive. The only one that doesn't have escalated B a cop is the cooperative Italian group study, and here the pet positive patients are getting ifosamide, gemcitabine, navalbine uh, for four cycles, followed by an auto stem cell transplant. So again, very aggressive toxic treatment for those patients, uh, but not B a cop. So I think, uh, in the near term that when we have patients who are positive uh, by PET scan, that we're still looking at using something like escalated BACOP. So um, this is a study that was published recently in Blood by Dr. Yunus and his colleagues at MD Anderson, which again, another interesting approach, and really trying to get at what we're all trying to do, which is uh, try and find new treatments that are not escalated via COP and, and uh, are more effective but less, but less toxic. So I won't go through all the background. This has been discussed uh, on many occasions in the past, including at this meeting, about why you might think about rituxan for Hodgkin's since the majority of the patients have CD neg CD20 negative Reed Sternberg cells. Uh, question is whether the background cells that are CD20 play a part and whether there may be CD20 uh, actually on a stem cell for the Reed Sternberg cell. So in this study, uh, they included patients who had stage three and four and bulky two Hodgkins. All patients received six cycles of ABVD and they received six weekly doses of rituximab during the first six weeks of their ABVD therapy. They had 78 patients on the study with a five-year event-free survival of 83%. Um, 
the IPS did differentiate patients, 88% versus 73%. And interestingly, the bottom curves here are the PET negative and PET positive patients. So you just continued on the same therapy, obviously. All the patients were getting RABVD, and they did not change the therapy for the patients who had a positive PET. So the, the top curve for the PET negative patients, uh, the two-year progression-free survival or five-year progression-free survival was 91% versus 77% for the PET2 patients. So the question is whether rituxan helps um, the most in the patients who would have been or who are PET positive um, or whether uh, the data that we saw previously, the retrospective data that we saw previously with the uh, prognostic significance of a positive PET uh, are not correct. And this makes me worry a little bit about the uh, other studies that are changing patients to escalated BACOP and showing event-free survivals in the 60% range, whether that really is different than what would have happened if those patients had continued with ABVD, which is what happened in this study. And so based on this uh, phase two study, uh, Dr. Yunus and his colleagues initiated a phase two uh, multi-center study uh, comparing RABVD to ABVD, and this was in a group of high-risk patients to be eligible for this study. You had to have an IPS of three to seven, and uh, we were one of the sites participating in this study, the primary objective, three-year progression-free survival. The target accrual, 120 patients. They accrued 58 patients in about four years. Um, and I think the biggest issue was this IPS of three to seven, in addition to having the competing trial, the competing SWOG trial open uh, at the same time. And the study did close prematurely earlier this year due to the slow accrual and the competing trial, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, which includes brentuximab, vidot. And so hopefully we'll still learn something from this. Um, my guess is that they still will report this in the 58 patients uh, when they have the three-year progression-free survival. And then um, just wanted to kind of combine what we're talking about with the ABVD and, and the prognostic markers as well, just to kind of put this out there and uh, be interested in um, Honest's take on this. But this is a recent publication from uh, Greaves et al. Um, uh, from the UK looking at 122 patients with classical Hodgkin lymphoma and they looked at the non-follicular CD20 staining in these patients and they were able to discriminate the CD20 staining in uh, normal follicles from the CD20 cells in the malignant microenvironment by co-staining with CD21 and there was no prognostic significance if you looked at the total CD20 staining um, but if you just looked at the malignant CD20 staining in the microenvironment, that there was um, a highly statistically significant difference uh, in favor of having a high CD20 level compared to patients who had a very low CD20 level in the microenvironment. So I think that brings up the question, at least in my mind, whether we want to be giving these patients rituxan and getting rid of these cells. Um, I think it also brings up the question of the microenvironment in terms of very difficult to figure out what's good in the microenvironment and what's bad in the microenvironment. And there have been a couple other studies that have confirmed this um, sort of good prognosis if you have more CD20. So then uh, my last wish in terms of trying to come up with regimens that are less toxic, um, new agents, um, obviously the brentuximab, the dotin that we've heard about is um, very encouraging and the question is how do we use that uh, in first line therapy since as we saw from the previous speakers that although it has a very high response rate that um, only about a third of the patients will achieve a complete remission, and about a half of those will have perhaps a more durable remission. And then um, I think, as is always true when you find a home run like that, that it does slow down the development of other drugs, and I think that's been very true for Hodgkin's. So um, I think Anna showed a little of the Everlimus data and Panabinistat, and basically once BV was approved that both of those patients, both of those drugs were put on the shelf. Uh, which I think is unfortunate. Those drugs will have to be tested again now in BV failures, and I think Novartis is probably not overly enthusiastic about going through that process. So although I think there is encouraging activity with both of those drugs, again, I think it's going to be a while before we can, can come around with that again.
So you've seen this slide just to remind you the response rate to the bruntuximab in the relapse patients, 75% with 34% CRs. And then this was the curve that the previous speaker showed about the durability uh, in some of the patients who achieve a CR with BV in the relapse setting. And so in terms of thinking about um, the future of advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma in terms of the upfront, I think Mort touched on this study a bit, which is the um, phase one study that was three institutions looking at initially the combination of ABVD plus BV and then eventually the combination of AVD uh, plus uh, brentuximab because of uh, toxicity. They had uh, 36 of 37 patients who had a negative interim PET that we have not yet seen the progression-free survival uh, on this, and I'm not sure actually whether they're going to report that. I, I think probably they will eventually, but since it was a phase one study, that was obviously not the primary objective. Um, the issues with the AVD plus brintuximab uh, and the ABVD, the first issue was uh, higher incidence of febrile neutropenia than you see with ABVD. And in this study, it was 11%, but also many of these patients did receive growth factors, and I think that wasn't well delineated in the uh, preliminary results of this, but presumably we'll see that uh, when these results are published. And talking to Jeremy Abrams at MGH, who's doing a pilot study in, in early stage patients, that uh, six of these patients, six of nine patients who did not receive growth factors had fever and neutropenia. So with this regimen, probably going to have to use growth factors, whereas we've just recently gotten away from that with ABVD. And then pulmonary toxicity, again, 44% with two deaths in the 25 patients who received ABVD. So can't do that combination. Um, the global study that is now ongoing, a phase three study of ABVD versus AVD plus BV, um, stage three and four patients, uh, the target accrual is 1,040 patients. It's been open about a year, although I think slow getting many of these sites open. Uh, 84 patients treated to date, so um, again, I think a much slower accrual rate than they were initially hoping. And again, patients get standard ABVD for six or this AVD plus BV. They do have interim PETs after cycle two, but no change in therapy. And then the other uh, BV upfront studies that are going on, uh, University of uh, Cologne looking at some BACOP variants adding BV. So um, it's about 100 patients, phase two studies and they're getting rid of Bleo and Vincristin and adding BV in one group. In the other group, um, they're getting rid of Bleo and Vincristin, but substituting the procarbazine with decarbazine. And uh, so we'll, I think those will both be interesting combinations. And again, I think the Germans are also trying to incorporate BV and get rid of some of the bad actors in their regimens as well. And then uh, again, just to touch on the Everlimus, Pretty high response rates, close to 50% in two phase two studies, uh, but unfortunately, because of BV, I'm not sure that this drug will ever see the light of day for Hodgkin's. So in conclusion, um, I think what the future does hold for advanced Hodgkin lymphoma uh, is probably still ABVD in the majority of patients. Uh, dose intense therapy for the 15 to 20 percent of patients who are PET positive, with the caveat that this really hasn't been proven in a randomized way yet and that unfortunately it's probably going to be at least five to eight years before we see the combination of ABD plus BV, but hopefully we will make progress with that, and that I think, at least in my mind, it's not clear that any of the recently described prognostic indicators perform better than the IPS. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bartlett, for that stimulating talk.